All right. Go. Welcome back to another episode of Compelled, a podcast where we attempt to bring out the bigger issues and injustices and what we as a society can do about it. I am Joe Spiegel. I am Mike Sutherland. All right. And this week, uh, Mr. Sutherland, who are we going to be touching upon? Jonathan King. Last time we talked about um, Saville. Jimmy Saville. Yeah. Yep. Or Saville. And Jonathan King. So as we were doing research on Jimmy Saville, obviously... Um, so Mr. King's part of the fallout. Yeah. Uh, we had been um, finding out more and more information about who all was involved with this whole Jimmy Savile thing and who he was with or who he was friends with, like yeah, Gary Glitter. Yeah, because the people on a grand scale like this, they're, they're never by themselves. Right. And one of them is Jonathan King or Kenneth George King. Uh, he's an English singer, songwriter, record producer, music entrepreneur, and former television and radio presenter. He first came to prominence in 1965 when Everybody's Gone to the Moon, a song he wrote and sang whilst he was still an undergraduate, had chart success in Britain and the United States. Um, Jonathan King has sold over 40 million records in his career. He's been an independent producer who discovered and named Genesis in 1967, produced their first album from Genesis to Revelation. He founded his own UK uh, label, or his own label in the, uh, called UK Records. He released and produced songs for 10CC and Bay City Rollers. In the 70s, he became known for hits that he performed and produced under different names, including Johnny Reggae, Loop de Love, Hooked on a Feeling, and Una Paloma Blanca. Um, Great. I'll never hear Uga Chaka ever the same way again, huh? Yeah. Uh, between 71 and 72, he produced... T- 10 top 30 singles in the UK um, while living in New York in the 80s. King continued to appear on radio and television in the UK, including BBC's Top of the Pops and Entertainment USA. In the 90s, he produced the Brit Awards, and from 1995, he selected and produced the British entries for the Eurovision Song Contest, including the winning entry in 1997, Love Shine a Light by Katrina and the Waves. In 2001... King was convicted of sexual abuse and sentenced to seven years in prison. He sexually assaulted five boys, ages 14 and 15, in the 1980s. In November 2001, he was acquitted, acquitted of 22 similar charges. He was released on parole in 2005, and then in 2017, he was charged again with historical sexual offenses. Now, just remember, everybody, for the record, and this includes O.J. Simpson, acquitted does not mean innocent. It just means that they weren't convicted of it. Correct. However, King was sent to a boarding school, first as a weekly boarder, to prep school in Hindhead, Surrey, then, when he was eight, to Stoke House Preparatory School in Seaford's East Sussex. A year later, in 54, his father died from a heart attack. Brookhurst Brookhurst, uh, Grange was sold, and the family moved to Cobb. It's a cottage in nearby Forest Green. Music became a passion of his. In 1958... King became a boarder at Charter House. Do you remember any of these things that we talked about? These are all places that Jimmy Savile went to. Frequented. And in 1958 was the first time that Jimmy Savile was reported to sexually abuse somebody. Mm -hmm. At Charter House. Surrey, uh, see, he wrote that he loved Charter House immediately with his history in every possible area of encouragement from sports to intellectual pursuits and touching little boys. Okay. Um, pause. Damn, the guy's has a prominent career. Yeah. Um, okay. So here we go. Um, you can read this or I can read this. It's up to you. Sure. Um, in September 2001, King was convicted after a two-week trial at the Old Bailey on four counts of indecent assault, one of buggery, and one of attempted buggery, which in the, in the States, uh, I believe sodomy is our term for buggery, right. correct? Committed between 1983 and 87 against five boys aged 14 and 15. In his second trial, he was found not guilty after an alleged victim, someone King denied ever having met, acknowledged that he could not have been over 16 at the time. He could have been over 16. Or he could have been, sorry. Three further trials that have been scheduled were ordered abandoned. King continues to maintain his innocence throughout, protesting, among other things, that the lack of statute of limitations in the UK for sex offenses meant he had been unable to defend himself adequately because of the years that had passed. So years are past, and so it's okay that he did that, apparently. Yeah. It's been a long time. Let's, yeah. Let's move past it. Yeah, it just doesn't mean nothing. Yeah. Yeah, why, why are you holding on to old shit? Yeah. 
So, I mean, the U.S. has a statute of limitations. The, the United Kingdom does not have a statute of limitations. You know, let me, I mean, this, this, is, this is kind of rhetorical, but if you, if you do something to someone that's going to damage them in one way or another for the rest of their life, why the fuck is there a statute of limitations on that? So even once that statute, I, I, you know what? It's it's a good question. I don't know. You know okay. um, I think it's because when look after thirty years, like if you assault somebody, you know, it's like how do you prove it, right? Yeah, and then after thirty years, somebody comes back. I think that's the reason why it's like you can't like retroactively go after somebody. Yeah, I mean because you have a repressed memory and your and your brain fucks with you. Yeah. You know, I would say I, I would assume. I think there should be like an amendment to that, know. which should be if you, even though that many, much time has gone by, if you have some kind of like proof, um, yeah, proof that like you can't contest, like like, like just like a video of it or witnesses, or, or wit, yeah, you know, w- multiple witnesses or like like you know paperwork that shows like letters that he confessed about it or something, right? You know what I mean? And everything proves that it's his, his handwriting or whatever. I mean, proof could even be that. This person was at this place at this time. Yeah. And and if a person says I was sexually assaulted or, or assaulted, it doesn't really matter yeah. at this point <laughs> because of statute of limitations. If if a person says this happened to me yeah. on you know, during this time, you know, it could be months, it doesn't really matter. Yeah. <laughs> Generally people tend to remember this stuff anyways. But you know, if this happened to me during these dates. Yeah. Right, and you can prove that that person was there during these dates because they had to sign in or whatever. Yeah, the burden of proof is on the person that they're going after, anyways. Mm -hmm. You know, so the defendant, the burden of proof is on the defendant. And at this point, you know, and I agree with you with the statute of limitations when it comes right down to it. But I think a lot of it has to do with psychology. I get. I'm just guessing. I, I mean, I know. Look, I know that it's difficult because people like. I, they've they've done the test where like people's memory on certain things can change over time, and it can be completely different than the way it was you know years beforehand and things like that. So I understand that, but uh, and I also understand about hearsay. You know, like it, just because you say someone did something to you thirty years ago doesn't mean that they did. You know, I can understand the statute of limitations for that. But dude, if I mean, if you've got like if you definitely have proof, like irrefutable type of proof or or proof that that you know. That an attorney really can't break apart very well, you know. I mean, a defense attorney can't break apart really well. Then I think that 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 should be that that should be held up. Yeah, uh, most crimes that have statute of limitations are distinguished from serious crimes as, as these may have may be brought at any time. In civil law systems, similar provisions are typically part of their civil or criminal code and known collectively as periods of prescription. The cause of action dictates the statute of limitations, which can be reduced or extended to ensure a fair trial. The intentions of these laws is to facilitate resolution within a reasonable length of time. What period of time is considered reasonable varies from country to country and within countries such as the United States from state to state. Within countries and states, the statute of limitations may vary from one civil or criminal action or another. Some nations have no statute of limitations whatsoever. I mean, what if you're emotionally traumatized to the point where you're in a fucking asylum for for decades, right? And then finally you're able to get out and then then people might start taking you seriously. Okay. The purpose and effect of statutes of limitations are to protect defendants. Yeah. There are three reasons for their enactment. A plaintiff with a valid cause of action should pursue it within a reasonable diligence. Reasonable. I mean, like, if you have 15 years, come on, you have 15 years. You need to do something or just not do anything. By the time a stale claim is litigated, a defendant might have lost evidence necessary to disprove the claim. Litigation of a long dormant claim may result in more cruelty than justice. In classical Athens, a five-year statute of limitations was established for all cases except homicide, in the prosecution of non-constitutional laws. Demosthenes wrote that these statutes of limitations were adopted to control sycophants, professional accusers. The limitation period generally begins when the plaintiff's cause of action accrues, meaning the date upon which the plaintiff is first able to maintain the cause of action in court or when the plaintiff first becomes aware of previous injury. So now we have a definition of why we have a statute of limitations, which makes sense... They were adopted to control sycophants. Yeah, and 
you know, the, I, I could see though, like a something that where you, there could be an exception, and the exception to that, what but besides the irrefutable proof kind of thing is, is like what if you know, like if, if these the, the defendants are people that are were in positions of power, you know, high influence, right? Um, and they're able to intimidate and pay off um, victims for a very long time. You know what I mean? Right. Shouldn't there be also like a, a um, an exception because of that as well? You know, for people, I'm not talking about some regular pervert off the streets. I'm talking about someone like Jimmy Savile and other people that have high connections and they've been powerful for decades. You know, because they can suppress people. A lot of times they do. Right, you know, but that's that's considered fraud. It's right here. When an officer of the court is, is found to have fraudulently presented facts or impaired, um, oh, that's an officer of the court. Well, that would be a, a lawyer. Yeah. So if you're if a, if your lawyer is doing that stuff, if if your lawyer knows, then that would be fraud upon the court if they know mm-hmm. what if, and they get caught. I, you look all the money they make. I wouldn't doubt if a lot of them t- turn a blind eye to that shit. Well, here, if a defendant commits a series of illegal acts against another person. Um, or in criminal law, if someone commits a continuing crime, then limitation period may begin to run from the last act in the series. Um, in the A Circuit case, Trenner v. MCI Telecommunications Incorporated, the court explained that continuing violation do- violations doctrine tolls, freezes the statute of limitation in situations where a continuing pattern forms due to illegal acts occurring over a period of time as long as at least one indecent or I'm sorry, indecent, incident occurred with the, within the limitations period. So let's say for the, in these cases, Jimmy Savile, okay? But let's say Jimmy Savile had, did all this stuff in America. Yeah. And even though it started in 1958, his last act happened long after that, oh, 30 yeah. years, 40 years. Yeah. So Up until like, right before he died, I think. Yeah. So in, in this case, the continuing violations doctrine, the statute of limitations would still continue. Oh, that's good. Because his last act, let's say his last act was in 2012. Yeah. Okay. Um, and, and it's only been six years. So I don't know how long the statute, I think it's 15 years, maybe longer than that. But let's just say it's 15 years, okay? Or 10 years. Let's just say it's 10 years. Mm-hmm. But even then, that falls within the 10 years, right? So according to this, Due to illegal acts occurring over a period of time is as, as long as at least one incident occurred within the limitations period. Okay? So he, he did it in 1958. He did it in 1962. Right? So it's every four years. Yeah. And then somebody complains about it. Well, that extends the statute of limitations, and it continues on. Did it in the 70s. Did it in the 80s. So every, every eight years he does it, right? But it was a lot more than just once every eight years. Yeah. You know, he did it quite often in the seventies and the eighties and the nineties, all the way up through two thousand. You know, I mean, he had he had access to a fucking hosp- mental hospital, right? Yeah, he had a fucking set of keys. Yeah, so he was doing this all through the seventies and the eighties and the nineties. So each one is another ten years added into that. That's a continuing. That's the continuing violations, right? Yeah. So if one person, one person complains. Right. Yeah. So the person in 1958 made a complaint to the police. That that's ten years, and then, the, then another person in 1967 complains. That's another ten years yeah. because it's within, and it just continues on. 1977, 1987. You see what I'm saying? So the smart thing for a pervert <laughs> would be to do something early, and then wait about wait about twelve years, and then do it again, then wait another twelve years. Yeah, but they the, the, you <laughs> criminals. Yeah. Repeat offenders. Well, I know like a pervert's going to do what they got to do no matter what, right? They're going to do it. Well, not just a pervert, but... I mean, you know what I mean. You know, people that break the law, they continually do that. Yeah, so, especially people that think that they're um, entitled to do whatever they want. Yeah, such as Jonathan King. Uh, the National Criminal Intelligence Service had begun investigating King for his child abuse in 2000 when a man told them he had been assaulted by King and others 30 years earlier. The man had originally approached publicist Max Clifford. Again, there is no statute of limitations in the United Kingdom, so 30 years is not that big of a deal. Um, The man had originally approached publicist Max Clifford, who himself was later jailed for (laughs) sexual assault. So we're going to look into him. Um, This is a goldmine, by the way. These fucking, these two Wikipedia 
things. Don't you think more like a scum mine? Yeah, but it's a gold mine of fucking in- information. Yeah. Clifford told him he needed to include a celebrity in his allegations and that he should go to the police. King was arrested in November that year and, and bailed on 150,000 pounds. 50 grand, which was put up by who? Fucking Simon, dude. Simon Cowell. He was arrested again in January 2001 on further allegations. One year later. 27 men told police, now we're up to 57, by the way, uh, that King had sexually assaulted them during the period of 69 through 89. Police found pictures of teenagers in search of King's, in a search of King's home. By the way, finding those pictures extends it. That's proof. Yeah. That's, that's, uh, that's a problem. Uh, King admitted having approached thousands of people with questionnaires about youth interests, saying he was doing market research. The questionnaires asked recipients to list topics according to importance. Um, music, sport, friends, and family. The prosecution claimed that boys who listed sex high on the priority list on the list of priorities were targeted by King. Um, After the second trial at the Old Bailey on the 21st of November 2001, Judge David Paget QC sentenced King to seven years in prison using the first trial verdict as a sample for all previous sexual behavior. In addition, King was placed on the sex offenders register, prohibited from working with children, and ordered to pay 14,000 pounds in costs. In 2003, the Court of Appeal rejected his application to appeal both the conviction and the sentence. He had argued that the conviction was unsafe and the sentence, with guidelines of two years, had been manifestly too severe. He appealed twice unsuccessfully to the Criminal Cases Review Commission and was released on parole in March of 2005. King's conviction was the subject of a chapter in Bob Woofenden's 2016 book, The Nicholas Cases. Woofenden. Examining what Woofenden then regarded as the 10 worst miscarriages of justice in the previous 30 years. In September of 2015, King was arrested as part of Operation Ravine, an investigation into claims of sexual abuse at the Walton Hop Disco in the 1970s. Oh, there's some more right there, huh? That we can look into. He was later released on bail. On May 25th of 2017, he was charged by Surrey police with 18 sexual offenses relating to nine boys aged between 14 and 16, allegedly carried out between 1970 and 86. He was released, or I'm sorry, yeah, he was released on bail and appeared at Westminster Magistrates Court on the 26th of June, where he was released on conditional bail to appear at Southwark Crown Court on the 31st of July. His trial is set to start on the 11th of June of this year, 2018. The ball just keeps on rolling, man. Yeah, it's amazing that these people... Um, I, 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 I'm at a loss for words for most of this the stuff. The only way that people like this can get away with all of the things that they've done for so many, so many years is because other people look the other way. And they continue to look the other way for multiple reasons, you know. Because of payoffs, because of opportunities, because of because uh, they're doing the same thing as well, you know, like protecting their quote unquote interests, right? Their own self interest, uh, and then also you know intimidation of power, you know, by power, right? Kind of thing. I because you look at you can't do that many things to that many children and get away with it without anyone knowing anything. Yeah, Jonathan King. The only apology I have is to say that I was good at seduction. Really, that's your fucking apology. Should the mere mention of his name turn your stomach and raise your blood pressure, please be advised that you are not the first to be appalled by the degenerate recreations enjoyed by some in the music business. Free love, Jonathan King complained in a 1968 Music Maker magazine article berating what he described as the seamy side of the pop world as considered natural behavior by a large portion of British youth. Pop performers, he went on, take sex wherever they find it, and there are very many outsiders willing to provide those facilities. Confessing that I do not know what the answer to this problem is, King, then best known for his 65 top 10 single, Everybody's Gone to the Moon, I'm sorry, Everyone's Gone to the Moon, noted that for some reason when an affair is ended, it is always the star who suffers. I have nothing but contempt for these little glory seekers who trouble the artists they were so keen to sleep with. Looking at that final observation now, more than a decade after King's conviction for having sex with teenage boys, Earned him a seven-year sentence and inspired red-top headlines such as Evil Lust of Pop Beast King. It seems curiously prescient, even if back then, as I suggested to the disgraced musician, broadcaster, and entrepreneur, he sounded strangely like a Methodist preacher. I believe in pursuing my own morality. That is all I have ever stuck by. It is my own morality that really matters. Oh, okay. 
If that declaration reminds you of the credo of the debauched occultist Alistair Crowley, do what thou wilt shall be the whole of the law. Uh, it should be said that Jonathan King still denies the crimes for which he was convicted of. One charge of buggery, we already mentioned that. We're talking in the living room of his muse house in West London. I'm sitting in a chair. Jonathan King reminds me, once variously occupied by Jimi Hendrix, John Lennon, Scott Walker, and depending on who you believe, other less musical guests, whose names surfaced only when they testified against him 11 years ago. His case, somewhat con- confusingly, was split into three trials. The convictions related only to the first. King was acquitted at the second, following with the CPS abandoned, which the CPS abandoned the third. He was released on parole despite having declined to participate in programs aimed at behavioral correction because he considers himself innocent. <laughs> Since he was freed, King, who discovered and launched the rock band Genesis, um, has written an autobiography, My Life So Far, and a novel, Beware the Monkey Man, published under the name of Rex Kenny. He has released two full-length films, the autobiographical Vile Pervert and a boldly eccentric music, musical called Me, 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 which was shown at Cannes. Um, Jonathan, give me a second here. Um, it's, okay, this is uh, interesting. Um, the, the writer, as he goes, in the course of work, I, will, I tell him I've interviewed murderers, arsonists, drug barons, and a man who, posing as a priest, first robbed a woman, then conducted the funeral service of her husband. But even those guilty of gross sacrilege or unlawful killing never experienced the detestation aroused by someone convicted of King's offenses. It would be far easier to quote the late novelist Gilbert Adair, writing in a slightly different context to confess to homicide. At least a murderer, Adair wrote, gets a respectful hearing. I explained that I found the experience of reading through victim statements relating to his trial to be disturbing, and that I can't bring myself to believe that he is innocent of the acts for which he was convicted. But our difference of opinion in this area, as on other subjects, doesn't begin to ruffle him. He remains calm, polite, and affable. His manner, kindly. I'm waiting for it to catch up. All of which seems odd to me, because if I'd experienced what you say you suffered, unfair conviction on the most grievous of charges, I think I would be furious. And then he says, I found rage to be a useless emotion. Prison opened my eyes to so many things. He describes how he read letters for illiterate inmates. It was a great time. I met interesting people. I got to understand the behavior of the police and the media. I am an observer of the human race. King is fond of drawing parallels between his fate and that suffered by Oscar Wilde, having spent two years researching an unfinished PhD. God, this is just... (coughs) It's so difficult to read through the independent UK because, you know what, I'm done with this. I I can't can't deal with the, the independent because it takes too long to load that fucking page. So pretty much the gist, the yeah, the gist is that he doesn't think he did anything wrong because however he feels is the right way for him, regardless of what it's done to anyone else. Well, yeah, exactly. But he also has been reconvicted. No, thank you. Um, Does he have like a problem? Like, is he always every picture? He has the same fucking smirk on his face. He may have had a stroke. Um, He's, let's see, uh, Jonathan King has been charged with 18 sexual abuse offenses. This was May of 2017 (coughs) against nine teenage boys uh, dating back 70s and 80s. Um, The charges are part of Operation Ravine, which was launched in 2015 after a review of Maryside Police of an early investigation, Operation Arendelle, which dated to 2000, which is the... um, that is uh, part of the Jimmy Saville or Saville thing. A Surrey police spokesman said the independent review was commissioned in 2014 to ensure all lines of inquiry had been identified. He is awaiting trial, I guess, or still dealing with the whole. Uh, yeah, I, there's, there's nothing's been resolved with this. That's what it comes down to, and unfortunately, um, it just, it just continues. It's like they don't. It's like he doesn't care. No, he like I said, he, and and all of these have the same exact conscience. They don't care. Yeah, no, he 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 believes that what he his desires are important because they're his desires. That's all that matters. And regardless, like he doesn't even take he doesn't even acknowledge that he's done anything wrong to anybody. You know what I mean? Which you know could be a lie or not. I don't know. The guy's fucking. He could be perfectly sane. He could be fucking crazy. I don't know. Oh, okay. So his his trial is set to start on June 11th of this year. That's why. So he's been released on conditional bail. So 
Um, is that a woodpecker? Uh, you already mentioned that uh, the Bob Wolf, Wolf, Woffenden's 2016 book. Yeah. Um, <laughs> King has complained about his media coverage since his conviction in 2005. He went to uh, the Press Complaints Commission about an article in News of the World that said he had gone to a park to ogle boys. In fact, he had gone there at the request of a documentary maker. The complaint was not upheld, but Roy Greenslade argued that King had a good case. In 2011, then, BBC Director General Mark Thompson apologized to King for the removal of King's performance of It Only Takes a Minute from a Repeat. King described the cut as a Stalinist revisionist approach to history. When asked by a newspaper in 2012 if he believed he had anything to apologize for to anybody, and that's when, you know, the only apology I have is to say that I was good at suggestion, su- seduction. I was good at making myself seem attractive when I wasn't very attractive at all. This is just fucking bullshit. It's a predator, dude. Yeah, Straight absolute up. fucking predator. And, um, you know, they, they removed a ton of the stuff from Tops of the Pops. My problem with removing stuff is that what you do is that you're cleaning up history and you can't do that. You have to have the good and the bad. Oh, well, yeah, just like you can't destroy all Nazi, you know, Nazi stuff because it's part of history, right? you got to right. you know, put it in a museum. You yeah, know? you can't wash it out. Um, history is very important. Right? Regardless if it's right or wrong, it's important to know what the fuck happened and continue. You know, look, there's people, there's people that have been brutally tortured and ripped apart by, by mobs and by dogs and other things because of the color of their skin and other things like that. And they did nothing wrong. And yet fucking turds like this get to keep on spending money, living a lavish lifestyle and doing this to children. Amazing. Fucking amazing. Yep. So I, I um, Operation Ravine is an investigation by Surrey police into alleged sexual abuse connection to the Walton Hop Disco. A previous investigation into the Walton Hop Disco, Operation Arendelle, resulted in the convictions of Chris Denning and music mogul Jonathan King for child sexual offenses. Uh, it is also related to Operation U Tree. Mm. And that's a police investigation into sexual abuse allegations, predominantly yeah. the abuse of children. U Tree was part of the Jimmy Savile thing, yeah. Yeah, and led by Metropolitan Police. Um, the report of the investigations of the activities of Savile himself was published as giving victims a voice. Um, yeah, so it also investigated others, but you know, some but not all linked with uh, Savile. Um, Nineteen people had been arrested by Operation U Tree. Seven of these arrests led to convictions. Uh, the U tree effect has been credited for an increase in the number of reported sex crimes, while the operation also sparked a debate on police procedure and rights of those accused. Okay, this is going to sound really weird, but it just popped into my head, so bear with me on it. Okay, you know how like we have, you know, there's all these genetic and 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 technological advances we have in the medical field and all this stuff, right? What if there was something you could do, like give to a child, like a like a shot, right? Where if Anything happens to them in a sexual manner that whoever did it, like it would be like a, a dye pack in a in a you know a bag of money, but it would do it to someone's genitals if they like. Is that, it sounds fucking weird. It just popped into my head. You know what I mean? You literally would have to insert someone into something into someone's butt to do that. Well, I'm, just, I'm saying it, this is fucking weird. I just if like that comes into contact with that then it, it causes some kind of reaction uh, where... But how would you do that? How would you regulate that? I don't... You have to literally give every fucking child in w- whatever country they're in yeah. some sort of butt dye pack. Well, no, it would be like a, a like a genetic thing where, it, like, they just... No, you can't do that. That's, I, that's why I throw in a what if, man. It's just... No. Dude, because you just imagine all the ideas that will come out in the future about things. And that, you, that's... <sighs> You're caught red crotched or something. You know what I mean? That's yeah. first and foremost, it's an invasion of of genetic privacy. Secondly, you it could be the, up to the parents. You, you, you. How the fuck would you be able to install that into somebody? It could be part of a part of when they get their shots. Just get that will be a you, shot. You can't. The, the, the body doesn't. The body is not like the body doesn't have. Uh, a defense mechanism, like a sensor that you can insert in the vagina or the butt, that that can predict rape. I, no, I, like I said, you'd have to work out all the details. <laughs> it's just a thought, man. I yeah. Well, in response to a large increase <laughs> to, of victims, to catch a pervert. I don't know. Yeah, it does doesn't work. 
Uh, thanks, thanks for supporting me, though. On that. I, I'm, that that I'm not supporting you on because it doesn't work. It's, it's Jesus, like a genetic chastity. You right? fucking state. Just get the fuck out of my house with that thinking. Um, God damn, that's that's the worst government shit I've ever heard. Like seriously, like that's the that's that's like that's like China dictating how you know who lives and who dies. You know when when children are born, and and I, I just I I can't follow along with that thinking. Okay, how about this? How about future technology where you could put something until someone as long as someone's a minor? Nope. You could have something in their eyes that could record things. Nope. And then then they could record their attacker. Nope. Of course, then their attacker could purposely take their eyes out. It's a tough one. Nope. But you have a backup database. Nope. You don't install you no no. This mm-hmm. is some Black Mirror shit. No. Have you ever seen Black Mirrors? No. I don't. I don't. That's... Uh, you can't do that to children. And and my and, and the reason for my thinking behind that is... And the reason why I said no instantly was... Mm. You are putting... You are putting the government in control of children. No. You cannot have government control of... It's privately anything. funded, then. No. You are putting the government in control of children. That's what it comes down to. Private or not... Putting the government in control of children, putting anybody in control of children is a no-no. Putting anybody in control of anybody is a no-no. Absolutely not. No installing of chips, no nothing. They want to do that. They're like like the dog chips. Yeah. They they already have like you can put chips in kids to to track them. Yeah. No, fuck you. Hmm. No fucking way. It's bad enough that we already have trackers on these things. Everybody has one of these. Oh yeah, the government. They, they, we they, all accept it. We all willingly accepted having a tracking device on us. They own. literally went around that yeah. whole idea of oh well they we can't put chips in them so fuck it, you know. And that's why I don't get. And that's the other reason. I mean, this is paranoia. That's why I don't get flu shots. I don't trust them. Dude, every once in a while I see something pop on my. My on my on my laptop screen, like it looks like a little thing will pop up, and it looks like a like a little camera lens icon or something. And the first thing that pops in my head is, what if someone just it popped in and looked at me real quick? On Most my, likely, on my laptop, it could happen. Just put a fucking piece of tape. Oh, on I'm not it. fucking worried. I don't do anything wrong anyway, so I don't, I, it doesn't matter. I'm just saying I'm not worried about put it. Put a piece of tape over it because you have a you have a young daughter. Think about that. No. So. Uh, in response to a large increase of victims coming forward in the summer of 2014 in the wake of the Savile scandal, I can ne- I will never be able to say his name right. Savile, Seville. Yeah, they always uh, said Savile. Operation Hydrant, a new operation in his, into historic child sex abuse allegations, was launched by the National Police Chiefs Council as of 20 May 2015. 1,400 suspects, 261 of them are public prominence, which means 135 from TV, film, or radio. 666 institutions, 154 from schools, 75 from children's homes, 40 from religious institutions, and 14 from medical establishments have been identified. Did you say 600 and what? 666. (laughs) That's the devil. That's the devil. Um, Operation Hydrant is not responsible for conducting independent investigations. It gathers information from other inquiries, including Operation Utree. That, in and of itself, is telling. Okay? When... You have 135 figures, public figures from TV, film, or radio, and 154 of them from schools. You have, that's, well, it's 289. That's 290, 290 just between those two things. Mm-hmm. People, suspects. Schools, fucking schools, TV, film, or radio. And none of these people give a fuck. They don't care. They don't care. Yeah. They don't care about you. They don't care about your your children. Just think about this. They don't care about your children. The only thing they care about is themselves, and they will always be like that. I don't even know what they care about themselves. They just care about getting off, getting their rocks. All I care about is themselves, dude. Just constantly indulging themselves, and constantly indulging into their their sick and twisted desires. Um. Operation Ravine was an investigation into the Walton Hop Disco. A previous investigation called Operation Arendelle resulted in convictions of Chris Denning, Jonathan King, and one other person. There was three people that were um, arrested. Denning was charged with six offenses stemming from the investigation. He pleaded guilty to 21 of them. Denning was sentenced to 13 years for these additional 
offenses. I don't know who the third person was, but we're going to find out. I mean, probably Gary Glitter. But we're going to look into Chris Denning as well and find out more about him. But other than that, this Jonathan King guy doesn't start his trial in 2018, until 2018, and he may go the way of the guy from Glee. Yeah. But I don't think so because he's too high on himself, you know. Yeah, he I, he doesn't he he thinks this shit don't stink. There's you know what certain people man I, I certain people don't have it in them to just f- spare the world from the rest of their evil and 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 move on from this existence. You know, look at Bill Cosby. I you know he he still acts like he didn't do anything wrong. He just got convicted. Yeah, you know he got convicted of just one person, just just some a few counts from one person's accusations, and you know and he's. He's going to get, like, probably, like, I think the maximum is, like, 10 years. Yep. Which means he'll be over 90 by that time. <laughs> that picture. I'm, I'm laughing at a picture on the internet, not not about talking about Bill Cosby. Right. Um, but, uh, yeah, it, it, it's, it's just amazing. Like, it, it's 59 people have accused Bill Cosby of this shit. And he is getting convicted. And, he, yeah, like I said, he, it's going to get, like, 10 years, maybe. Maybe. Um, they... They pulled his passport, but they let him go home. So he gets to sit at home while he, he waits for his trial or for his sentencing, you know, which could be nothing, <laughs> you know. Uh, his sentence could be nothing or up to 10 years, you know. So is that justice? It's a mild piece of justice. Is it enough? I don't think it's enough. It's better than nothing. But, you know, I, you know what? I, I will say this with Bill Cosby. At least he's still alive to get this, get you know, to, to face some of his accusers instead of like Jimmy Savile who died before all this shit came out about him. You know what I mean? Yep. So I, but fuck dude, I, I just, the dude's 80 years old. He's already got to fucking enjoy all the raping he wanted to do and, and all the, all the money and spoils of his career. And you know, now he's, does it, I don't know. It's tr- either way you, you, you do it. It's tragic. So fuck you, Bill. Yep. Yeah. I don't, <laughs> I don't, none of that shit make, I don't care because, no one's doing anything about it anyways, and, and we're two fucking guys from Sacramento. I just want to talk about it, but the consequences are the consequences, and when it comes right down to it, it's like nobody cares. So, And that's why I want to keep doing the show. Anyways. Just keep it going. Just, you know, at least get, you know, keep it in people's minds a little bit instead of not at all. So, all right. So, for Compelled, I'm Joe. Mike. All right. You know, tell the truth. Stay safe, and we'll uh, see you next time. Yes.